Hello everyone and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. These virtual events let us go deep with musicians and experts on a specific topic. I'm Tim Munro, creative partner with the SLSO. Today we are talking about the relationship between music and physical and mental health. And we have quite a panel. I'm going to speak with a professor of music, music therapy, a professor of physical therapy, the president of an independent living facility, a nationally recognized yoga instructor, and two of the SLSO's own skilled musicians. It's quite an event. But first, a housekeeping thing. Please do ask questions using the chat function. Make sure your message is sent to both panelists and attendees. You can ask our guests about the therapeutic potential of music, about their favorite mental health playlists, about the music they love, anything. It's going to be an action-packed hour, but I'm going to try to get to some audience questions along the way. Special thanks to the SLSO's 2020-2021 Classical Series sponsor, the Stewart Family Foundation. And this Lunch and Learn is sponsored by Washington University Physicians. I'm delighted to welcome my first guest, Laura Dwyer. Laura is a flutist, a teacher of music therapy and music appreciation, a yoga instructor, and a beloved member of the SLSO team, where she works with the Symphony Volunteer Association. Welcome, Laura. Thank you so much, Tim. I'm delighted to be here today, and I love that I'm getting a chance to represent the volunteers and music and health in general. Oh, I love it. Well, so reading through your bio, you wear just a million professional hats, but it seems like many of them are united in a belief in the connection between music and health. I wonder if you could think about when you first thought, wow, music and health, those things are so connected. Actually, that, that's a great question and it's something that I, I can immediately uh, touch to because when I was in undergrad and starting to deal with the rigors of performing, I really started kind of understanding that I was having uh, a reaction on stage that was unusual. And so it was like, what is, you know, I didn't even know what it was called. Of course, we know it's performance anxiety and we, we all deal with it to some level, any performer does. And, and that's when I first began to work with um, breath work and yoga and meditation. So it was an easy thing to, ah, yes. But here's what happened. I, in my effort to soothe myself on stage, which I did, I noticed that I actually felt really different in the world. And that was really life altering. It, it really changed me as a, as a performer and as a human being. And it really set me on a course of, of trying to share that with as, as many people as many music lovers, as many performers, uh, as many people um, that I, as I could. Oh, that's so beautiful. Um, I wonder if you can sort of share with us in a general sense, what are the ways that you think that music and health are linked for you? <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're linked in incredible ways. And, and I think one of the ways that I, I, I like to talk about it is that we know a lot of things about what music does, and I think that probably that's going to come up later in this conversation, that it, it increases the dopamine in our brains. And it actually then, through facilitating then, creates a, a level of oxytocin, which is the love hormone, which makes us feel good, makes us feel loved, makes us feel happy. So that's really important. But it does something else. And this is what I, I didn't realize for a long time, and the science is sort of caught up with what I was teaching, and I've discovered what I was teaching. <laughs> There's actually, without getting too technical, there's something called a vagus nerve. It's called the wandering nerve. And it comes from the, the, the stem of the brain down through the neck and throughout the body. It innervates our organs. It innervates um, our breathing mechanism, absolutely everything in our body. The most important thing that it does is it is actually the stimulator of our parasympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest part of our nervous system. And so it's a very calming, uh, relaxing sort of state that we can get into. And it's not, it's different than just being like um, out of it. We don't want to do that. We don't want to walk on stage or be in the world and just be like, you know, completely relaxed. But we want to be available. We want to be there. I think um, one of the things that I, I was very much influenced by when I began some of this work is I read this wonderful quote um, by Yo-Yo Ma. And he said, every year, relax one more muscle. 
because the more relaxed you are, the less tense you are, the more you can hear. And I love that because really what's happening is when we are calm, when we have soothed ourselves, when we feel safe, when we feel loved and valued, we're more available to the world. We're more available as listeners. We're more available to receive love and friendship from people. And it began to make me realize that, you know, what music is really doing, it sort of, it sort of softens us. It melts us. It allows us to um, be more available to the world, to our own hearts, and to what we're trying to communicate with one another. Oh, yeah. So, so music in some ways, like, opens us to the world. I know can, it does. Can, or can help open us to the world. That's beautiful. You mentioned before your work with the Symphony Volunteer Association that that's a great passion of yours. Can you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing with that organization and also just like how that, um, how you see music connecting people through those programs? Absolutely. Well, with my work with the volunteers, you know, I, when, when I first started the job, I think um, about two years in, one of my friends says, oh, so you manage volunteers. And I remember thinking, that's not at all what this feels like. And it made me realize how my philosophy and my approach with it is really what I'm doing with them is facilitating their ability to get close to this music that they love. So I'm just helping them be able to do that more. They, they love the symphony. They are the, in, in many ways, the core audience. They're the ones that are there week after week after week. And they're, I'm sure there's some of them out here today because they come to absolutely everything that we do. And they love the music so much. And so helping them get closer to the musicians, helping them, um, helping them provide music education through the SLSO to the wider community um, is, is a really important uh, function in our ability to let them help the staff create uh, fundraisers or work with donors or work with teachers in the community. There's so many ways that they help us. And I think that that's really the main thing that, that I'm doing with them. However, the most important, I think, thing under that is helping them develop a sense of community. Music brings us together. As we say, we, it softens us, it opens us, allows us to experience more our own inner world, our own inner landscape. And a lot of my volunteers are recent retirees or longtime retirees. And so there's a loss of community. There is a loss of working toward a common goal that many of them had in work. And so this provides that for them. We're now providing this opportunity through this wonderful music that we all love to come together and find a common purpose, create new lifelong friendships and um, delve deeper. I think that's something that we're all missing in the world actually. I don't, I don't think we sometimes realize that's what we're coming to music for, but there's a little bit of a lack of depth. And I mean depth of emotional life. I don't mean depth in terms of just information. There is plenty of information available at all times, but we seem to be missing a core sense of depth of, uh, of connection with one another. And so this is an opportunity because we know that music does that for us. It really deepens our experience in every way. That's so lovely. Um, actually, Jamie asks a question in the chat about, since you're talking about deep connections, are there two or three composers who you feel like very deeply connected to? Like what's the music that really kind of stirs you up? Oh, that's a tough question. I mean, it's, it's usually, this sounds cliche, but it's usually um, partly what I'm working on. <laughs> you know, that whatever piece that I'm working on at, at the time, and, and I'm, I'm working on a piece called I Will Not Be Sad in This World, which is really powerful to me right now. Um, so that, that's one. But you know who is always there for me is Beethoven. Um, Beethoven always, and it's because of what he overcame, and that you hear often in his, his music this, this loneliness that he's feeling and communicating, and aloneness, like I have to face this world on my own, and then how he manages to do that throughout the whole process of a piece in his life, and, and he always comes out with this triumph but it's not triumph over something. It's a triumph of loving life anyway, no matter what happens. And, and so I, I love Beethoven, I always will. Well, and talking about both that piece that you were talking about, I will not be sad in this world and Beethoven dealing with adversity does sort of bring up maybe my final question, which is about as the pandemic has unfolded over the past year, like how you've observed 
people's relationship change with with the change between music and health change between um, themselves and music themselves and health like what have you observed well it's 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 really huge um you know like I, I i've been doing this work for a long time and working with musicians with performance anxiety but i just finished another slate of classes at, at the curtis institute and the juilliard school of music and this time the focus was very very different it was about managing what's happening to us in the pandemic and how do we how do we maneuver our way through this because i think you know for all of us there was a grief all musicians had this sense of of grief of being pulled away either from their ability to study live and in person with their teacher that they worked so hard to get into school to, to work with, or this lack of our own community of playing together, of creating music and, and doing what we love. But that's true of everyone. Everyone has experienced some loss and grief at this point that, that's really enormous. And then this sense of that isolation coupled with that, put that on top of that. Um, so now we've got loneliness, we've been anxiety from fear, um, all of it's happening to us all at the same time. And so that's what we're, we're looking towards. And, and I'm working with them on, on breath work and, and meditation and finding ways to you know, activate that, uh, that uh, parasympathetic nervous system, activate that and, and get our oxytocin levels up and our dopamine up. And we do that through music. And you know, it's fun, to, it makes me think that, that what I'd love to tell you today is, is that, that you can actually influence the way that you feel really powerfully with music, but you can do it in a way that it actually um, works with your brain in a great way. And so I wanna, I wanna ask you all to take a moment today and listen to something you love, and it really doesn't matter, and, and it, it'll change from day to day. You know, what, what sound are you listening to right now that seems to be touching you, or what do you need? You know, do you need to be uplifted, or do you need to be calm? Listen to some music, and take a moment and visualize someone that you love while you're listening to it. And just imagine that person in as vivid of detail as you can get, and you'll begin to feel that. And that's a beautiful thing. When you feel that and the music is going, you're really creating oxytocin in your, in your body. You're creating that dopamine release and you're connecting really strongly to your own heart. And as you listen to that and you visualize that, begin to take a moment to feel some gratitude for that. And that's soothing also your vagus nerve all at the same time. And if you hum along, <laughs> to anything. It doesn't matter if it's Beethoven 5 or Tchaikovsky 4. It doesn't matter. John Williams movie scores, uh, uh, you know, whatever it is. Hum along. Set your timer for 10 minutes and listen and hum. And then I'd love to hear from anyone who wants to, to write me about how different that makes you feel and how healing that is and what a salve for the soul and a salve for our hearts. You know, I heard this wonderful quote the other day um, as well that, that uh, it was Ariel Berger who was speaking about his teacher, Elie Wiesel. And um, I'm not sure where this quote was attributed to at the time, but the, the quote was that um, when we talk over each other, there's cacophony and dissonance. But when we sing together, there's harmony. We come together. And truly that's what music does. And you can do that in your own heart on a daily basis just by listening to music. There's so much stuff on our website that we can connect to. Wonderful, beautiful, powerful music played by our wonderful symphony. And uh, I urge you all to listen and, and hum and imagine and start that process of healing. Oh, I feel like I was just taken on such a lovely emotional journey. Thank yeah. you for that. And mm -hmm. I just before I let you go, I'm gonna say that there's a couple of comments in the chat, Suzanne, talks about her experience as a volunteer with the SLSO and loves working with you, Laura. Mm -hmm. And then um, Louise says that she is interested in volunteering with the SVA. So maybe we have a new connection. Absolutely. Uh, Fabulous. So I just want to thank you so much for your time and your thoughts and your, your, um, the beautiful addition that you've given to this uh, chat. So thank you, Laura. Thank you so much, Tim.
Um, now, several weeks ago, I was lucky enough to speak with Dr. Gammon Earhart um, over Zoom. Dr. Earhart is a professor of physical therapy, neurology, and neuroscience at Washington University. Her, re her research is so fascinating. It explores the relationship between music, movement, brain, and body. She's collaborated with the SLSO several times. Um, we're going to watch a video now uh, to hear what she shared with me. Well, so thank you for joining us, Gammon. Um, I wanted to start off by actually talking about what seems to be closer to your core work, which is the relationship between movement and its therapeutic uses. When did you first realize that um, our body's movement could actually like help heal? Well, I think I've had a sense for that for a long time. So I'm a physical therapist by training. And so our focus is on movement and how the different systems of the body interact to produce and support movement. And so understanding the importance of movement for health is really core to that training. But I think I've started to think outside the box a little bit more in terms of, you know, sort of different things that you might try, including dance, for example, uh, probably in the, the mid 2000s, um, really based on work with some students who came through our research lab who had experience in those areas and brought that expertise to bear. So we combined that with rigorous scientific design. And that was really how we sort of got into this idea that, you know, the arts go hand in hand with movement. Thank you. Well, so you made a perfect segue. So let's touch on that. Um, you talk about it thinking outside the box. Um, can you say a little bit more about that particular, like how you came to realize that um, music and dance had an importance in this sort of work? Yeah, in, in our case, I actually saw an abstract presented at a Society for Neuroscience meeting, and it was a small study done by a group at McGill University in Canada, and they were looking at uh, frail elderly individuals, and they had one group that walked for exercise and another group that learned to dance tango. And they noted that the group that learned to dance tango actually had larger improvements in their ability to think as well as their walking ability than the people who were walking for exercise. So our lab was already working with people who had Parkinson's, many of whom have difficulty with walking in particular. So we decided to take that idea and see, you know, could this be a feasible approach for people with Parkinson's? And so we started that and sort of have, have never stopped since then in thinking about dance and now more recently music in particular and its role in enhancing movement. Um, you've never stopped dancing ever since. And actually I, I saw a couple of photographs of you actually dancing with some Parkinson's patients. Yeah, so that was part of the process. I actually didn't know the first thing about tango. When we started that line of, of work, it was actually Madeline Hackney, who was a PhD student in the lab at the time, who had that expertise. Um, so she was the first person who taught me some tango and then I continued to take lessons over time so I could keep up with the folks participating in our studies. Oh, I love that. That's so beautiful. Um, now, maybe could you talk a little bit about the work that you've done with the SLSO? I gather you've worked with an ensemble of musicians that's from the SLSO, a, a tango group called Core Tango. Yes, yeah, so I've had a couple of opportunities to do some uh, events with Core Tango. Uh, one was at a nursing school, and we were able to sort of present the science that was going on in our lab, looking at tango for people with Parkinson's, and then have live tango music and a demonstration of actual tango dancing by some professionals, and really just giving students the opportunity to just see what tango really is and what it sounds like, and not just hear about the science, I think really enriched their experience. Um, and then we had an opportunity to go out into uh, an assisted living facility in the St. Louis area and actually speak to older adults who were living there about, again, the science, but also um, then Cortango came in and actually did, you know, live music and a, a session where people got the opportunity to try dancing to that live music, which is really wonderful. And then we've had um, a larger event actually um, at the symphony where where Tango was on stage performing, and I was able to talk a bit about the science. Um, you're, you're, I can't help but see, see that you're grinning as you're talking about those things. Uh, is there something about having live musicians in this that, that kind of changes that um, experience? 
I think there really is. I think it's it's a much more dynamic experience. You feel like you're part of something happening in the moment and versus, you know, listening to a, a recording or, or watching something on a video. I think, you know, actually experiencing it yourself in real time is a different opportunity. Um, I wonder if we can zoom in a little bit on maybe what we know of what happens in the brain uh, when when that sort of work is is going on. Yeah, so we know some, but we certainly don't understand everything. So there have been some interesting studies looking at uh, people who've learned to dance tango in particular, even. Uh, these were done with, you know, sort of typical age college students who, you know, they scan their brain before they learn to dance tango, they teach them tango, and then they scan their brain afterward and look at any changes in brain activity. And what they've shown in those studies is that once people learn tango, the areas in their brain that are active when they're imagining themselves walking are actually different. And it's more in areas that we normally associate with paying attention to things. Um, so there's actually sort of a different cognitive process going on that I think makes sense, you know, as you're learning to dance tango, you are paying close attention to the way that you're moving um, and learning certain strategies for, for moving. And so, you know, that, that shift is not entirely surprising. And Frankly, it's an area that we would, you know, be happy to see light up more in people who have difficulty with walking because it's a compensatory mechanism. You know, if the walking doesn't come automatically anymore, perhaps we can enlist these other areas that are involved with more focused attention on something to enhance that walking ability. Now, is it tango specific or are there other styles of dance or other styles of music that you've looked into? Uh, is tango kind of uniquely suited to this sort of uh, effect? So we have actually looked primarily at tango, but we've done some comparisons to waltz and foxtrot, as well as uh, a modern dance form called contact improvisation. And across all of those studies, we've seen improvements in people's movement, particularly their balance and their walking. But it seems like tango always comes out just a little bit ahead. <laughs> that's, that's super, that's so fascinating. I mean, obviously, the, the form wasn't designed for this purpose, right? I mean, it sort of comes up organically out of a, a culture and a, um, a music and a way of being. But that's amazing that it has this, this effect. You touched on um, the fact that you've moved from looking at uh, tango to also looking more generally about, at, at music's therapeutic uses. Is, is, have you looked a little in that? And, and what, what are you coming to understand in broad, yeah. broad strokes? Yeah, so we, we have um, shifted to not just look at um, the dance, but sort of, you know, the, the music as part of that experience, but really pulling out the role of music and specifically looking at how music and singing can enhance walking performance for people with Parkinson's. So there's been a long history of several decades of trying to assist people with their walking by giving them music or the beat of a metronome to step to. And so they can synchronize their steps to the beat and therefore, you know, improve their walking, perhaps walk more quickly than they would otherwise. The, the major difficulties we see in walking with people who have Parkinson's is that they walk more slowly and they take shorter steps and that they're more variable from one step to the next, which can increase the risk of falling. So we know, you know, historically that if you give somebody music that's at a tempo that's a bit faster than they would normally walk, they can match that music. They can take steps more quickly. They can oftentimes take bigger steps and therefore walk faster. Um, but what we've seen in our work is that when you do that, it actually can sometimes make the variability higher. So they become less consistent in their walking when they're trying to match that external beat. And as I mentioned, that's related to fall risk. So we think we, we don't want to introduce something that would increase this variability. So we've turned to singing instead with the idea that, well, why not generate your own rhythm that you can match your steps to? And perhaps that would be easier because you're generating it. It's a bit more predictable. You're not, you know, trying to match something external to you. So we've tried that and actually seen that we can still see improvements in the size of the steps and the speed of the walking. But when you're singing and matching your steps to the singing, your variability actually goes down, which is exactly what we would like to see. So we're exploring that further right now with a, a grant that we've had funded recently. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I, that, that, that makes my heart sing that I mean appropriately that's um so beautiful and also like 
I think I, I want to transition to our last question, which is just about the general, our, our sort of the difficult time that we're all having at the moment and how music can help with that. And I think of myself walking down the street and singing and there's, 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 it brings me to a different mental place. But I wanted to ask, do you have thoughts about, you know, in this difficult time that the ways that pe music can be helpful in people's lives? Yeah, absolutely. One of the, the biggest things that I think is that, you know, incorporating music into your daily routine and particularly during your exercise or physical activity, which again, as a physical therapist, I think is vitally important, you know, to stay active, to stay moving, despite our restricted ability to, to go into certain environments. But, you know, the, the more active that people can stay and the more they can move, the better. And music is one of the biggest factors in increasing people's enjoyment of exercise and movement. So incorporating that into your daily routine, I think can really help you to, to stay motivated and stick with an exercise program. Um, and then of course there are opportunities, you know, just to, to sit down and sort of get lost in the music, if you will. I think it's sort of a form of mindfulness to just be in the moment, listening to the music and not worrying about what happened yesterday or what's gonna come tomorrow. Thank you so much for taking time with us today. I really appreciate your your incredible research and your your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I was I was just like uh, bursting with joy after talking to Gammon. Um, so many fascinating ideas uh, in the connections of mind and body, and so much uh, interesting current research. Um, but our next guest is going to put those puts those ideas into practice. Um, Joan Dennison is president and CEO of Covenant Place, an independent living facility for older adults. Welcome, Joan. Thank Hello. you for joining. Thank you for having me. This is such a wonderful program. It's so interesting. Oh, I'm so glad you think so. Well, so Joan, can you tell us a bit about the Tango Project at Covenant Place, how it came about and what it involved for the residents? Absolutely. So I have to really, you know, uh, give some uh, accolades and acknowledgement to Maureen Byrne, the Director of Diversity and Community Affairs at the St. Louis Symphony. Um, Maureen had this wonderful idea. Um, we've known each other a long time. We've had wonderful concerts from the symphony for many years here at Covenant Place. We have about 400 residents, by the way, age 62 to 102, so we're quite a large community. And Maureen uh, said, you know, I've been reading about Tango and Parkinson's and, you know, maybe we can do something together. And so with Maureen, we baked up this idea of a month of Tango at Covenant Place. And this included um, having dance lessons that residents could sign up for. So they had several opportunities with professional dancers to have lessons on how to dance Tango. Uh, Dr. Um, Earhart, the person you just uh, listened to, came and did a lecture, which, by the way, was very interesting uh, to the participants. Uh, they talked about it for months and even years now afterwards, how impactful that information was and how it actually changed a lot of the way they uh, approach their exercise and daily living uh, to stay in shape and to listen to music and to use it as a tool. And then there was a culminating event where a Cortengo Ensemble from the symphony came and played the music live and uh, people were invited to dance and participate in that way. So whether uh, people chose to watch and uh, watch the dancers or participate uh, either in the classes or at the actual uh, musical event, uh, there was a great deal of participation, whether from a chair or on the floor, in joy in the whole month of Tango. That's wonderful. And I believe we have a, a short video just to show um, of that project. <laughs> Residents at Covenant Place Retirement Community are moving to the music. Just walking together, just moving together. 
you know, if you don't move it, you lose it. Thanks to the tango-inspired tunes of core tango, the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra is helping these seniors stay active. It's always good to get moving. You sit all the time, you get stiff. Prior to the performance, Covenant Place sponsored tango lessons for the seniors, and they learned all about the benefits of tango during a presentation. The music is a source of external cueing. Dr. Gammon Earhart is a professor of physical therapy, neuroscience, and neurology at the Washington University School of Medicine. Well, the evidence suggests that there are lots of ways that people can benefit from participating in tango, whether it's improving their walking ability and their balance and reducing their likelihood of experiencing a fall all the way through improving quality of life. The presentation, tango lessons, and performance are all part of the St. Louis Symphony Cares program. SLSO English horn player Callie Bannum, who is the core tango band leader, says the best part about tango is the feeling it gives people. When you combine the music with the movement, endorphins going crazy, making you feel good, make, making you feel young again, right? <laughs> the performance also gives Harvey Altman a chance to sweep his wife off her feet all over again. It brings back memories on there. So it's, it's, a, it's a good feeling. For the SLSO Stories from Backstage. I love it when the symphony comes here. I'm Anthony Kiko. Oh, that's lovely. So wonderful. What responses did you get as a result of that program? And I, I wonder if you're thinking about other project programs in the future. Well, it was a wonderful program. And we had, um, as I said, not just a response on that day, but really it had some lasting impact. Um, we do um, have about eight, well, pre-COVID, about eight exercise classes a week and um, these are open to the community by the way uh, we have a, a senior center here a covenant place that's open to the community called the Murowitz center and this includes you know ballet and um, other classes uh, into which music is very much integrated um, we also have a community choir and i did notice there was a question earlier looking for some evidence on um, Alzheimer's uh, for patients' ability to access music. So I thought I might share a kind of a beautiful story. Please. Uh, our choir, which is also open to the whole community, we had uh, a woman contact the choir director and asked if she could bring her husband, who really had become, uh, was not speaking very much, but still always loved music and would sing old songs when he heard the music. And could he possibly, could she bring him to the choir? So the choir director said, absolutely, but and come with him, you know. And so this would happen. He would come, he would kind of have his head down, the music would start, he'd lift his head up, and he would sing the songs that he knew. And so they were given a learning CD to take home. And the wife said she'd play the CD all day, and they would just sing together because that was how they were communicating. There wasn't really any other verbal communication. And this became such a central part of their life together that the choir director received letters from the whole family, the extended family. And actually, when he eventually then did pass away, um, his wife started coming on her own. And so this thing of what music can do to connect with people uh, at such a deep level, at such a meaningful level, it was, it was really incredible to watch that. And so everything that's being discussed today, I think, you know, that music can go to a place in someone's brain and someone's heart and someone's body that's very unique and very special and certainly different for each individual. Joan, you also mentioned that um, that people in the community can access your programs. Maybe is there a way for a place for people to go to find out more information? Yes, um, the website is mirowitzcenter.org, M-I-R-O-W-I-T-Z.org. Um, we have free online programs pretty much every day, um, all different kinds of programs, including programs that uh, revolve around the themes of music, opera, etc., and uh, musical theater. Um, and uh, there are also many recorded programs from what we've been doing the last year. You can you know, look through on the news and resource tab of the MuroWitzCenter.org program, all free. So we welcome anyone who wants to look and see what's available. There's a lot of different things. Um, to learn and to do. 
Well, thank you again so much for spending time with us for all your thoughts and the, the amazing work that you're doing. Really appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Um, so just be and just before we move on um, in the chat, there's a few mentions of a project that I was actually sort of involved with through the Pulitzer Foundation. Um, uh, it's a piece for scattered choir for choir choir members who record their voices individually in their own homes during social distancing. Um, piece called "Until We Gather Again," and the and um, SLSO Philanthropy has put a link to that piece in the chat. Um, I think it, it ties a little bit into this um, discussion just in the sense that so much of the piece is created by the participants themselves. It's not just a piece that is written by a composer and sent to the participants. They're, they're incorporating their own thoughts and their own feelings about this time. Um, I am now delighted to be joined by uh, three guests. Cynthia Briggs, Professor Emeritus in the Music Therapy Program at Merrillville University and by two SLSO musicians, violinist Ju Kim and cellist James Shashevsky. Uh, oh, I was so sure I was gonna do such a good job of that, James Shashevsky. Okay. Um, welcome you, to you, you all. I'm gonna start with you, Cynthia. Um, I just wanted to start with a general thing. Um, it, it feels a little bit as if the field of music therapy is not well understood as a kind of general thing. Maybe, can you give us a sense of what music therapy is, what the term encompasses? My pleasure. Um, the field of music therapy is actually a field of study and people who finish a degree are credentialed. There's a national examination. And so someone is a board certified music therapist. Um, but as far as the education, it is at its core a music degree. It is accredited by the National Association of Schools of Music. So a credentialed music therapist is a musician and they, in addition to studying music theory, principal instruments, they have proficiencies in piano and guitar and voice. And their studies are built around the idea of how do we take music and its elements into a therapeutic setting? So for a music therapist, the goal is always a therapeutic goal, not a music goal. If I'm working with someone on guitar, I'm not there to teach them guitar lessons. Now the guitar lessons might come out of working on on digital, you know, on, on things having to do with your hands. But um, the, the goal is always something that is therapeutic in nature. So their studies are to how do I take the elements of music, um, <clears throat> melody, harmony, rhythm, uh, form, all of those things into a therapeutic setting and use them to sculpt a therapeutic intervention. Oh, that is so clearly put. Thank you so oh, much. Good. That I just feel like that has cl clarified a lot of things for me. Um, I wanted to, you're doing so many different um, areas you're involved in many different areas of music therapy research but i wonder if you can talk about a program called creative music making which is a collaboration between Merrillville university the slso and the st louis arc can you tell us a bit more about that program with pleasure and we've been doing it this week so it's it's right there um 12 years ago mark thayer who was with the symphony he was maureen burns predecessor approached me about creating what became creative music making because he had a similar experience when he was with the New World Orchestra Symphony, excuse me. And um, he, he moved on to bigger and better things and, and um, Maureen stepped in and this is our 12th year of creative music making. So creative music making is a collaboration between the symphony, um, Maryville University's music therapy program and the St. Louis ARC. And together, the three organizations and their, their members and, and students taking the lead sculpt a, um, a three-day experience for individuals that are part of the um, client base at ARC. But when we do this project, we call everybody involved a musician. So in the interest of inclusion um, and, 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 and appreciation of diversity, um, we are all musicians when we work together those three days. Oh, I mean, I, I cheer loudly for that in all of society. Um, uh, always when people tell me, um, that I as a musician am like somehow set apart from them. It always, it always, I always have to cheer loudly that, that we are all in many ways musicians. Um, Ju and James, uh, I wanted to move on to you guys. Uh, you both frequently perform as part of the SLSO's program, Symphony Cares, uh, where musicians provide free performances for those who may be able to attend a Powell Hall concert. I just wanted to ask a first general question. Why is that program important to you? Um, well, 
you know, of course, we're we're so busy performing all the time for very diverse audiences, but it's especially performing. I think it's a an audience where we feel like we can make an impact, especially and usually our um, the audience consists of you know cancer patients in the Indian center, and so when we're performing for them. We feel like we're not only you know I, I think music has a restorative or hopefully a restorative um, presence for a lot of people, but I, I think for, for those particular people going through you know difficult treatment and medical issues, it, it's very um, meaningful for us to try to help with this is the best this is what we know how to do best play music and this is sort of the, the best way we can help them sort of um, you know, I, I think music can be obviously, you know, different types of music and we've been talking about this today really evokes different sort of emotional responses. So, you know, in this setting, we're trying to play music that's calming and relaxing and maybe just take, you know, give them a sense of more of a sense of uh, calm and, and peacefulness in, in, in that situation. Yeah, and just be able to take part in being able to provide like an ounce of Distraction for that the time being, and it's it's very. I think that has to be probably the most meaningful part for for this year. Um, thank you both, and James, you touched on. Um, sort of how you sort of are thinking about the sort of music, but how do you go into programming these these um, these performances, and and how long do they typically last? In I, practice, I think we uh, we our session sort of we play through about forty five minutes. About forty five. About forty five minutes, and um, mainly, I mean, they definitely can consist of calming and soothing music. I think. Um, at first we were through um advice to play specifically music with the markings of the metronome um, of like 60 to 80 so it's because that's a place to represent you, could you move a little closer to the oh. camera maybe oh, just oh, sorry to the microphone and and maybe oh. say that last part again yeah so Thanks again um we we try to pick soothing and calming music and specifically um, slower in, in tempo. I think we were um, advised at first to play something along the metronome markings of 60 to 80 because that that represents about the, the resting heart rate for, um, for for people. So, and that's always interesting because we, you know, we we want the 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 variety of the music to still be interesting and and various in nature, even though we are sort of keeping in within this window of similar tempo. That's wonderful. And uh, Cynthia, Cynthia was touching on the, the notion that music therapists, their, their primary goal, they are not necessarily musicians in that moment. You are, you are sort of, you're performing a therapeutic function. Do you, do, do you feel like James and Ju, do you feel like you're, somehow different as musicians in those moments does it does it change the way that you play perhaps or the way that you interact with the audience oh definitely um i mean from like a technical standpoint i you know i'm not so concerned with making obviously like you know so or, or like the words of projection and sound right for example i do have to think about the room and the general atmosphere and um more um yeah more intimate setting and so that affects the way we approach and the way we approach to, that translates to the way we actually play. Okay. Yeah. yeah you know along with that line you know we're certainly you know very mindful of the space we're in so you know we're, we're playing softly um calmly um and it's just about we're, and as we're playing we're, we're trying to get a sense for how the room is reacting to the different music and just trying to get um, a sense of calm, relaxation, and peacefulness as much as we can um, for those 45 minutes and just play something beautiful that we can, you know, give somebody, you know, a smile or a sense of, of calm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Cynthia, there's a, there's a question in the chat for you. Um, where are music therapists employed? Is there a variety of clientele? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, we kind of joke that we go birth to death. Um, there are music therapists who work in neonatal intensive care units, children's hospitals. Um, one of the largest employers um, nationally in both and St. Louis um, area is um, special education settings. Um, all of the St. Louis area's major services for mental health services have music therapists in their system. Um, and many, many music therapists work at uh, in assisted living, um, hospice care. Uh, so music therapists are employed very broadly and, and often what happens for music therapists is they find um, a, a patient group or a client group that, that they really quote unquote resonate with and um, you know, they, they, that kind of becomes their niche, but um, it's very broad. Yeah, and I was actually also just wondering, like, if if I wanted to become a music therapist, what, what is it? Is it just a, um, a a a training program at a at a an, a university? What, how would I get? What are the stepping stones into that career? Um, for a traditional education, a student might come in uh, to earn a bachelor's degree in music therapy. Maryville University is one of I think ninety universities in the, in the United States that has an undergraduate degree in music therapy. We also have a master's degree. It's not unusual for individuals who've already earned degrees um, in music and have done performance um, to come back and kind of do uh, a, an equivalency is what actually what we call it at the undergraduate level or a master's degree in music therapy to add those skills um, to their repertoire. Lovely. And there's actually someone in the chat who says that his grand uh, granddaughter does music therapy for hospice awesome. patients and got her MS in music therapy at Maryville. Maryville. Wonderful. So, um, I, I have one more question for you, Cynthia, about a very particular part of research that you did that I found very interesting, which is um, on um, infant attachment. You've worked, it seems, a lot with children. Can you talk about what infant attachment it is and how music can play a role in that? Absolutely, and stop me if I go on too long. Um, the elements of music that we talked about and the voice are the, the, the primary way that we attach to infants. Um, when a, a child is born and the parents begin to bond with that child, um, it's through rhythm and touch and sound. And um, so music becomes this very natural vehicle for facilitating that. Um, for a variety of reasons, a child may not end up having built good attachment or parent may not have built good attachment. Perhaps they were absent, half the child was hospitalized for a long period of time. A variety of things can happen um, that, that, that interrupt that process, that natural process. And music becomes a great facilitator for beginning to kind of reconnect and rebuild those links. Um, the reason attachment is so incredibly important is not just so that we you know, feel connected to those loved ones, but they build neurological tools. When we become good attachers, we build neurological tools that we take forward for a lifetime. It, it lets us make friends, it lets us make colleagues, it allows us to move through the world comfortably because people are, are someone, you know, are things we can attach to or connect to rather than being um, disconnected um, as we move through life. So um, attachment skills become tremendously important um, and music becomes just a very, very natural facilitator. So that's been our interest. Hmm, that's, uh, that's amazing. Um, and I, I, moving on to Ju and James, I, I, Ju, I know you particularly work with young children as, as a teacher. Um, what you find in working with young people who are, aren't not yet able to read, but who um, have this very close interaction with music, how you have found that a valuable experience? Um, <clears throat> I mean, just sort of from my teaching experience, I mean, for example, you know, I might see um, some of my students who are hesitant to, to be in the lesson to, to start with and feeling a little bit uncomfortable, but as soon as we start playing music, that's, I mean, it's just an easier vehicle for for us to communicate with others, right? So even especially those um, younger kids who, who might be a little bit uncomfortable in their setting or who are feeling awkward, but through their through music, they're able to just sort of let themselves go better and express themselves. So, I mean, Cynthia um, <laughs> um, explained so, so beautifully with words, but, but yes, I mean, absolutely. In, just instinctively, it's a great 
door to community events. Um, and there were questions in the chat earlier about people's, uh, the music that they find um, takes them to a place like that gives them calm and, and, and um, um, joy. I wonder if the three of you can sort of give us like your, your short playlist for when you're struggling something that m is, is particularly meaningful to you. Maybe I'll start with J um, James. Um, I'm trying to think of pieces of music that really stick out. I probably, for a sense of calm and just beauty, I I think my favorite piece of music is the slow movement of um, Beethoven's Emperor Piano Concerto. I think it's just so um, beautifully written and no excess and it's very simple. And it really hugs at your heartstrings, at least for, for me. So that, that's something that I, I listen to often. And I, every time I listen to it, I, I'm really, um, blown away by how perfect it is. And, you know, it occurs to me that it's, it's, made, it's about quarter, you know, quarter note equals six. It's like got that 60 pulse, maybe, maybe a little bit slower. Yeah. But it, uh, you were talking before about how that's where the kind of zone you're trying to like hit in terms of like finding calming. So I, I love that you're also on that wavelength. Um, what about you, Ju? Um, actually, that's so interesting because I, you know, four years ago when I gave birth to my daughter, I had made a um, playlist to to listen to before writing into library. It's like one of the things that I had prepared, and um, many many actual pieces on that list were second movement of a piano piano concerto. Actually, the second movement of the Ravel piano concerto, um, second slow movement of the um, Chopin piano concerto, the, the Brahms. It's so interesting. Um, yeah, I, I never, it was just like, just whatever music I got I, that I really enjoyed sort of gets me to, to really just enjoy the purity of music without any distraction. And things are too complex for me to think about. And yeah, that was the really thing. Well, and it's interesting that you're both choosing, I think as musicians, we study fast, fast, fast things a lot. Mm -hmm. But when we when we come down to it, when we want when we're really trying to find meaning and 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 um, uh, practice mindfulness, th th that's when we find these beautiful slow things. Cynthia, what about what about you? Yeah, you know, as a child, I attached really early, studying piano from the age of six, to Bach, and I still sort of listen to Bach to just feel good about life. Just sort of there's a euphoria for me. But if I want to relax, I really want to talk to my muscles about letting go and relaxing. I'm probably going to go over to Debussy and Ravel and Fauré and, and slower, you know, the slower movements. I love what you said, you, you know, it's kind of like, it, it does actually tell your nervous system, like power down um, and those work for me. That's lovely. And um, because Laura earlier in our chat suggested that we're all going to spend a little moment this afternoon listening to music that we find um, healing and beautiful, um, Maybe that's a lovely note to leave us all on. So um, Cynthia, Ju, and James, thank you again so very much for joining us. I really appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and it's been great to spend time with all of the amazing guests today. I want to thank all of the guests for joining us. Laura Dwyer, Gammon Earhart, Joan Dennison, Cynthia Briggs, and our SLSO musicians. All right, I think I disappeared for just a moment there. It's been wonderful to spend time with you all today. Um, I want to thank all our guests, Laura Dwyer, Gammon Earhart, Joan Dennison, Cynthia Briggs, and our SLSO musicians, Ju, Kim, and James Chashevsky. I want to thank the Stewart Family Foundation and Washington University Phys Physicians for their support. And thank you for joining in with questions. Um, just a quick note about some other SLSO goings on. This month, the SLSO welcomes audiences back to Powell Hall for socially distanced performances. Concerts run through mid-May, and you can find details at slso.org. And mark your calendars for the next Lunch and Learn on Wednesday, April 17 at 12 p.m. And I can announce that it's a discussion with the SLSO's music director, Stefan Denev. Um, please be there with all of your questions because he is a delightful presence and uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to ask him all of your 
most imaginative questions. Check your email inbox in the next week or two for an invitation with details. Um, thank you all, and I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs>